Welcome to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Today we have a special guest, Adreen Nazarian, the assembly member from the 46 assembly districts who's joining us today. Adreen, how's it going? Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Under the current circumstances, uh, so far, so good. Yeah, we're, we're all adjusting, I guess, to a new normal. Uh, can you kind of tell us, I guess, how the last, was it two, three months have been going, kind of sheltering in place and I guess working at home? Uh uh well that's loaded i mean you're you're, you're talking seems like you're talking about several years at this point because of what's okay. been going on we started with you know whether it's dealing with a homeless crisis and then moving on to the uh, covid pandemic and then and then now with the with the civil unrest and protesting and the some uh, and and the related issues that are going on with that not to not to downplay the unemployment and all the issues that are happen taking place with constituents calling in concerned about uh, how they're going to be able to stay in their uh, 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 rented units or housing units. Um, and then trying to adjust all of this with uh, continuous communication with colleagues and staff and various agencies and departments. Um, working out of home has been like uh, reminiscent of a campaign and uh, just, just in a much better area. I mean, I, I get to work in my kitchen and, and be able to be in a comfortable environment to be able to address everything. But it just, this has felt like a campaign where you're on the phone all day long and trying to deal with different crises. Um, you know, I guess you just outlined a lot of things that have been going on this year. Um, you know, earlier this year, you know, we had an incident with Iran. We had an impeachment trial. As you said, those seem like years ago now. And every week we seem to have a, a new, more pressing issue. And I guess, yeah. how, how have you been, I guess, reaching out to your constituents and seeing, being that you can't personally, I guess, be in front of them? Um, kind of, how are you, I guess, are you communicating with your con constituents and your staff to, I guess, help address these issues? Uh, constituents directly, I, I try to have as many meetings and be accessible as much as possible. I think the when the first week um, during literally the first day when I got back from Sacramento in March, I think it was March 16 or 17, when 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 we ended session and we recessed for the time period, uh, I was very quick to letting my staff know both in the Capitol and in the district office that this is all, all our operation is now going to be by phone. And so it's going to be very critical at a time when people are not seeing us to make sure that urgent follow-up takes place immediately because you need to maintain the confidence of the public, especially at a time when a lot of, a lot of times folks are going to call sometimes just to even know that government is still there. It's still working. So uh, there are some very basic levels of outreach and support that needs to undoubtedly happen on a very expedient manner so that everyone knows that you're there, you're you're catering to their needs, and that you're also listening and addressing issues and providing support if need be. And then second, try to figure out how to address issues going forward because now we're dealing with the constraint of agencies being overwhelmed. And as all elected officials are putting calls into a select number of agencies and departments, it's going to be harder to get through and try to be able to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish on behalf of your constituents. So making sure that the lines of communication that were established already continue being reaffirmed and having those conversations to make sure that everyone knows that, okay, let's set up some kind of a weekly opportunity to go over everything so that I'm not calling you constantly on different constituent issues, but we're spending that half an hour going through everything on a weekly basis. And so coming up with these parameters so that you can better manage and you can allow those that are helping you to better manage and then to allow your constituents to know also that you're managing their cases as you're going along. I guess, you know, you've been at, you know, worked before, prior to becoming a member. Uh, I know you were a staff member and you kind of worked in a local level. And I guess, in, I guess in your time working in government, is there anything comparable you've seen or dealt with um, that has prepared you, I guess, to handle these issues this year? A um, couple of things. I, I think the 2008-2009 era of budget deficits really comes to, to, to play. I mean, I, I, the, for the last year, well, 
when you go through a cycle like that, you can't help but to always think about that and always remember uh, how unfortunately thin line that level is, that base is, the floor is under you that you can easily break, break. And to make sure that you're always working up the reserves, always making sure that you have contingency plans in place. So with that backdrop, I was a chief of staff at that time to then assembly member Paul Krikorian. So it, it was, it just, it leaves an indelible uh, memory. Uh, and then, and then going through political campaigns and going through those short stints where for, you know, four or five months period or, or longer, eight to 12 months period, however long the campaign may be, you're in one confined space and you're, you have a team of people and you're working together continuously towards this one specific objective. You know, I, I kind of drew upon those two experiences and tried to formulate a way of dealing with all the different issues that were going to be coming at us with, with my team and with my staff so that we're, again, we're quick to respond, but at the same time, responding with helpful information that can actually get through. But, uh, but the 2008-2009 budgetary cuts, those, were, I, those are things, that, the flashbacks that constantly come to mind. Right. Um, I guess, you know, recently you guys have come back in the last three weeks. Kind of what, what was it like coming back to the legislature and I guess dealing with these new protocols? Um, if, you, if you recall the, if you know Charlton Heston's movies, one of Omega Man, that, that, that's exactly the feeling you have when you're walking through the state capitol. You're, you're, uh, you're completely alone. I mean, I, I, I'll go through my, from my office to the restroom or to the lounge or to wherever else. And even in the hallways where there would be a usual bustling of staff and members and running into people, nothing. There's absolutely nothing. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a very eerie feeling, um, you, especially when you take on a job like this. And, and, and thank you for pointing out my, my background as a staffer. I've been a staffer for 14 years. So you get very accustomed and used to always working with people, always... Sometimes the work even takes place along the hallways. Sometimes when you're out at a coffee and 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 you have an opportunity to have an exchange very quickly and be able to uh, 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 continue a conversation, a piece of a conversation, all of those have been taken away and are lacking now. So uh, you rely on a lot more of continuous communication and generating those communication opportunities. Um, you know, recently the governor came out with his May revise. Uh, you guys had a, a meeting, a committee of the whole, to, I guess, to address the state budget. I guess yesterday, uh, the Assembly and the Senate kind of, I guess, came together and agreed on a budget plan. Can, I, can we get your perspective on the, the budget? Um, well, for starters, it, it's it, it just, again, it's, it's always horrible when you have to deal with either worse or even worse circumstances. Uh, so you're either making bad decisions or even worse decisions. Um, so I think the governor, governor's May revise was a attempt to very quickly come up with a solution of uh, saying we're going to be basing a lot of things on the triggers and we're not going to look at all the reserves right now. We're going to space it out over some years. Um, our approach was uh, very different in first of all, restoring a lot of the major cuts that had been made, uh, utilizing a lot of the reserves right now and saying, look, let's allow the triggers to take effect once we for certain know that the trigger, uh, that, that the federal funding is not going to come in. But if we make the cuts as of July 1 and the federal funding comes in later in September or October and We've now dismantled programs and we need to hurry up and put it back together. That destruction in itself and the funding that's going to go in to uh, restore certain programs and put back things back into place in itself is going to create a waste. So I, I do like what our budget has done uh, with the, the, the joint budget. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to the negotiations that are going to be taking place with the governor and his administration to try to come to a conclusion where we look at benefiting from federal funding and having the triggers help rather than just basing everything on the triggers right now. Um, 
you know, I guess being a, an elected, have you had conversations, I guess, with your local uh, congressional officials to kind of see, I guess, what the uh, chances are of relief coming from Washington? We, you're always in communication. You're always uh, attempting to stay in touch with uh, folks at not only above you at the federal level, but then folks well, at the local level that you're working with so that uh, you're, you're, um, you're, you're hearing the needs and you're also passing on uh, concerns. And so trying to figure out also what, what is going to, what, what uh, opportunities there may be. Uh, I think we're all cautiously optimistic given some of the personal conversations and group interchanges we've had uh, of, of uh, looking at federal funding come in. But at the same time, um, given how long this short five months so far has been of this year and how many lifetimes we've lived in the last five months right. uh, or even less than five months uh, and, and seeing what can change all of a sudden and how the bottom can fall out so quickly. I mean, just up until a few months ago, we were riding high as the state uh, with not only being the fifth largest economy, but our revenues and reserves being in a place that had never been before. And yet just four months later, short four, four months later, we're looking at having to tap the entirety of the reserves that we had worked very hard for the last six, seven years to build up. So. Um, so we we are in communication and and I think there's a feeling of optimism, but again, you want to be cautious. Um, so I guess if if the federal funding doesn't happen, would you assume that you guys would come back, I guess, in August or maybe call a special session later this year to, I guess, address the necessary budget changes? That's something that uh, like, well, we'll have conversations, obviously, with the speaker and leadership and figure out. Um, with the direction of the budget chairs, uh, with Holly Mitchell, as well as with the, in our house with Phil Ting, figure out what the best course of action would be. Um, I'm I'm hoping that um, that there is in, in the ongoing conversations with the governor, there's going to be enough of a understanding of um, what we can count on and what we can rely on, and so that we move forward with a budget that works. Uh, but if we need to come back in September, then then we a special session is most likely going to be the avenue that's going to allow us the opportunity to do it. Uh, I guess kind of following off your comment about how in the beginning of the year, you know, you guys were coming off record surpluses. Um, you know, I know a lot of members had some big plans um, with legislative packages. Uh, and then, you know, recently they were told they needed to scale back and I guess focus on certain COVID or economic recovery uh, fire issues. Um, can you kind of, I guess, describe to us or explain to us, you know, I guess how your bill package has changed, I guess, through the last, you know, month or so? Oh, significantly. I, I, you know, at the beginning of the year, I had at least a minimum of about 25 bills, and that's not even including all the committee bills that I had. Um, uh, uh, the aging and long-term care committee uh, meeting uh, bills. And then... Um, on the budgetary front, you know, I had worked with the governor and several of my colleagues, including uh, Phil or uh, Phil Ting, as well as uh, Kevin McCarty, and we had worked on making a major investment on um, establishing basically a scholarship program for every child born in California. This was in the state's budget last year. Uh, the governor himself had worked on something like this in San when he was mayor of San Francisco, so he really liked the idea and work very much like the bills that I had introduced starting about three years ago. So we worked on putting something like that forward and we had put a down payment of about $50 million investment in last year's budget. And we were hoping to grow that steadily so that it gets to a significant mark so that moving forward, you can start implementing the program, have a small little contribution into every child born uh, towards college or technical trade or some kind of a career enhancing opportunity for that student when they get to the age of 18. Um, and then and then see how we can continue financing this program, maybe even through uh, private foundations. So when you're looking at major investments and projects like this, and or just the number of bills that I, you know, I individually had started on, and I'm sure some of my colleagues even had more bills, uh, now we're down to not even discussing anything, any other expenses in the budget, 
and looking at, uh, I cut my bill load down by at least a fourth. It went from about 25 bills to down to about six or seven bills. Oh, wow. So, um, and, and, and for the most part, they were all, they're all focused on some arena of all the healthcare bills, basically, or most of the healthcare bills ended up staying in play because one of them has to do with insulin copay cap, which also is a very important component of, uh, of uh, insul- diabetes being one of the comorbid- or comorbidity issues that uh, has been uh, played even more exacerbated uh, by uh, COVID-19 virus um, uh, to, to plasma uh, donation centers, um, given also what's been going on with the, with the use of plasma to address uh, 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 therapies uh, uh, for, for COVID-19 impacts as well. So just a quick rundown of some of the bills. Um, I guess as chairman of the Aging and the Long-Term Care uh, Committee, have you guys looked at, uh, I guess, changing, you know, the way, I guess, long-term term care is looked at or, uh, I guess, addressing certain bills to um, kind of, I guess, keep seniors more safe in these facilities? As you know, it's I, I haven't seen the numbers, but, you know, total, but it, they, they've been quite staggering, uh, the number of deaths and the number of cases in these long-term care facilities. They have been. They have, they, they, you're talking over 40% of the impacts coming in from uh, from seniors and especially disproportionate number of them uh, coming because of the uh, senior skill, uh, the, the skilled the nursing facilities. Um, so first and foremost, we're going to be having a, uh, I joined with uh, Assembly Member Jim Wood, and we're going to be here having a hearing on that uh, coming uh, this Tuesday, uh, uh, I believe June 8th, if, I'm, if I have my dates correct. Um, and then, um, I'm sorry, June 9th. So we're going to have a joint uh, hearing on, uh, on looking at skilled nursing facilities and what the impacts have been. Um, and also moving forward, what are some of the issues that we need to be looking at and tackling? Um, where personally speaking also, I don't want it to just be a rehash of the last 20 years of issues because we've known for a very long time the vulnerabilities and the susceptibilities of skilled nursing facilities. And some of these changes have not been uh, taken shape in the past. I mean, we've, uh, we can go far, as far back as a little Hoover Commission dating back to 1996 that is going to be pointing out some of the same things that we're going to be talking about at this hearing. So for me, it's going to be, and I believe for, for Jim as well, it's going to be critical to have what are the actionable items and how is that going to result directly in maybe even bills that we move forward this year, but certainly next year uh, on making addressing some changes. Um, I guess as our population, you know, our baby boomer generation is, is getting older. Um, I guess we're going to see a large number of people probably entering these long-term care facilities. I guess, you know, what, what is the outlook or the future of these facilities? And I guess, how do you see them evolving in the light of this um, crisis? Thank you for bringing that up because that's, that's, I should have probably started out with the numbers uh, and to say how critical this is. I mean, we're, we're looking at age, uh, senior population in California right now, age 60 and above, comprises about 12% of our population. It's estimated that with about 10,000 10, individuals hitting that age threshold on a daily basis, we're going to be hitting 25% in 15 years, in less than 15 years. So when one-fourth of the state's population becomes seniors, uh, has more needs at that point potentially, uh, on healthcare, on transportation, on social services, and plethora of, of other things. You're looking at the current system, how we've been dealing with addressing the needs of the 12% population, and looking at if things are, may, are held constant, how is this going to be enough to be able to address the needs of 25%? and all the vulnerable populations of subsets of populations within that 25%. And we're nowhere near being able to address those needs. I mean, you look at our uh, IHSS support. I mean, the IHSS was just, in the governor's May revise, was going through a cut and we restored those cuts. I mean, we need to be paying folks that are gonna go in and take care of our seniors and our aging so well 
that they're not competed away from those jobs into technology and some other higher paying jobs. And we need to be training them so well so that they can better address a lot of the issues so that some of the mistakes that happen right now in this last crisis don't take place again in the future. Uh, because a lot of times it's staff that was introducing the virus into uh, contained environments. So uh, I'm now mixing IHSS in home services with issues also with SNFs and other centers. But the general premise is still the same. So, yeah, I remember during the committee of the whole, um, Member Wood kind of stepping up and saying, you know, here we are cutting funding to these programs and I guess encouraging people to go instead uh, to facilities when those are the most dangerous parts. And maybe we should relook at that and encourage more people to stay at home. You know, I guess, you know, is there, a, I guess, in kind of what you outlined with the population, elderly population growing, you know, is this going to be the next housing crisis where we're going to need more senior living or more long-term care uh, facilities? Or is there, I guess, more, more of a hope of people being able to live in home and kind of having more in-home support? Well, the governor's budget was working on something along those lines, but, but there was just a lot of detail lacking. So I'm looking forward to also continuing that conversation because he obviously had some ideas and his administration was putting in a lot of thought. Uh, part of that thought was also coming because of all the input they were receiving on working on the master plan. And that had gained a lot of traction and it was moving forward pretty well. Uh, in fact, last year, working with, this, with, with, the, with the governor's administration, we had uh, uh, been able to move several budgetary items forward. I mean, the, the MSSB funding, uh, the increase in MSSB, uh, and several other areas were critical components that the governor saw value in and wanted to address that aside from just moving uh, the thought of the uh, MOU, uh, I'm sorry, not the MOU, but, uh, but uh, the, the master plan, um, we also need to be putting some meat on the bones and making sure that we're putting in the, the funding in the right places so that critical services uh, are expanded. Um, with, with, everything, with everything that's taken place now, I mean, I, and I appreciate you bringing up housing, so, so there are so many fronts for us to be dealing with. And one of one of my fears right now is, and LA just had a a five earthquake. Um, you know, the last thing we need is whether in Northern California fires or Southern California uh, seismic activity, one more natural disaster because that would just be more than a trifecta of impacts that we can absorb. And, and one of my critical fears when it comes to infrastructure has been if there, if, you know, our, our, our uh, vulnerable housing, uh, what, I, what, sorry, when I say vulnerable housing, what, our, our affordable housing uh, caters to the most vulnerable communities and, and is the infrastructurally most vulnerable as well. Most of our buildings that are in our Section 8 or affordable housing programs are the ones that are 80 years old, 60 years old, uh, are built prior to any of the major seismic retrofit required uh, or building code upgrades that are now in place and protecting lives. And so with one major incident, you can just imagine how many more people are going to be left homeless, especially at a time when we still don't have a vaccine uh, uh, to prepare. Now, this is a doomsday side, so I don't want to focus too much on it. But, but as you can imagine, these are things that also you worry about and you think the, the, the vulnerabilities are great right now. So uh, that's at this point right now. But then moving forward, I mean, there's so many investments that need to be made to make sure that not only are we paying people well enough to continue doing the work of catering for our aging, but also getting the training necessary and also being paid well enough to not be competed away to other jobs as well. So, and that's just a workforce issue. Um, and then there's many other areas that also need to be addressed. You know, I, I think housing is especially interesting, I guess, in, in your district, uh, being, I guess, on the outside of, of Hollywood there, where you're seeing, I guess, a lot of young professionals moving 
um, and you're seeing, I guess, the housing prices um, really skyrocket around your area, addressing affordability. I guess, you know, I guess what, what is a solution for affordable housing in, in, I guess, in your district and what kind of the things are you working on? Well, you know, we, we keep on hearing about how we need to build more, and that certainly is an issue, but you can continue building more, yet we're also now seeing, and there's been some interesting articles that are coming out, and this is just a sliver of an issue. It's not the entirety, but it's a contributing factor. But we saw from the last economic downturn how there was a complete retribution of uh, housing wealth going from many people to a very small few people. A lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of equity firms are sitting on hundreds or if not thousands of housing units, and they have not put them back on the market. So there's been some of that. And then in the last 10 years, when you've seen the growth of app-based businesses, and in particular in the housing front with Airbnb, uh, now you're seeing articles coming out about how many individuals were buying up properties and then putting them back on the market through Airbnb. Well, the more we did some of these things, the more we restricted the marketplace of housing for it to remain affordable for younger families moving in and trying to start get a head start on, on life. And so there's so much that I can push my constituents on saying, look, we need to build more. There is a need for building more. When you look at the maps of LA County, and you see that a great percentage of land in LA County is single family housing. You know, we could, we could afford doing that back in the 50s and the 60s when the population was relatively small. Right. But at a time like this now, when population has just grown, uh, has been continuously growing up until just two years ago when the population started dipping, but when the population has been growing uh, and housing stock isn't being developed at the rate that it was 20 years ago. We're almost developing about a third of the housing stock that we were doing 20 years ago. So, you know, so in, when you're looking at the graph, in one way, the population is going up and another way, the housing stock is coming down. Well, what you're doing is you're just, the price point equilibrium is just being pushed up. That's all that's happening. So you're arbitrarily just forcing housing costs to go up when it shouldn't be that way. And then you add in all these other factors of who is maintaining housing units and who's holding on to them and how it's, how it's uh, taking shape. Um, then you're seeing why artificially the housing prices are going up. Now, the reality is given the congestion we're dealing in places like San Francisco or Los Angeles, housing co costs are going to naturally go up. But I think a lot of these contributing factors have also exacerbated that and pushing the prices up even more so than they need to be. Yeah, it's really amazing seeing, I guess, the jump in housing the last, I guess, five or six years. You know, I used to think a million dollar house was something really expensive. Now, you know, it's a two million dollar house is, is kind of your entry level home in a lot of these areas. And it's kind of hard to imagine that a lot of young folks can. can yeah. And by the way, in... in, in Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you, Jared. But in some ways, like when you look at the microcosm of different areas too, in my in neck of the woods where, where entertainment industry is a, a, a very critical component of the economy uh, and a big contributor to the, to, to the entire state, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, when, when we implemented the tax credits and we were able to effectively bring back some of the lost jobs or at least maintain, the, given also how the increase in platform has allowed for greater production. I mean, some of the things that we lost, we will never be able to get back, but we're fortunate that with the greater number of platforms available, production has increased that way anyway. And what's that done is made LA more uh, attractive again for folks to come in uh, for, because of the entertainment industry. Well, so when you have folks coming in, if some folks can afford to pay a certain premium, it then further raises the cost for others. So, I mean, there's so many different dy dynamic impacts that are taking shape. But my point of this was part of the bet success also was that we were able to get some of our entertainment jobs back. But then, unfortunately, it's also had potentially uh, some small of a sliver of an impact on the housing prices as well. So, 
Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. I, I guess to circle back on, on one issue you raised earlier about your, your bill uh, regarding insulin, um, you know, there's been a lot of focus up here in Sacramento the last few years about, um, you know, diabetes issues and yeah. um, insulin. Can you kind of, I guess, go more in detail on some of the issues surrounding insulin delivery and kind of what your bill seeks to do? Sure, sure. It's, it's, it's actually a pretty straightforward bill. Um, the, the, the gist of the bill is to cap the consumer's portion of the copay. So if uh, uh, under your healthcare plan, you need to go in and you're going to purchase a certain, you're, you're going to buy a veil of uh, insulin for, for, your, for the month, you would be paying upwards of $100 or maybe even more in certain cases. Wow. And so what this does is it caps it at $50 and it ends it there. Now, in certain segments of the diabetic community, uh, there are individuals who need to have multiple dosages uh, uh, or variations of dosages. And so they may need two or three vials. So they could easily run up the cost upwards of 250, 300 or more dollars. And when you're starting to deal with circumstances like that, you can easily see how certain individuals start rationing how much they're taking instead of taking what's prescribed for them to take in order to keep them healthy. Because once they start rationing, then other issues start kicking in at the same time, start impacting their health, which then raises the healthcare costs because then they need to be treated for other circumstances. Right. So, uh, so this bill, all it did was it said, you know, if, if you are going to get a one dosage, m- one month long dosage caps it at $50, and if you need to get multiple dosages within a month period, it'll cap it to a hundred dollars. Uh, we did a Chaburk analysis, which is a, uh, a, a, a program that analyzes all uh, healthcare cost impacting legislation and policies. And uh, the analysis came back that this really should not impact at all uh, healthcare premiums or costs. So moving forward, this will just save the the out of pocket costs for already insurance paying individuals. So if you're paying a premium, or if you're covered, your healthcare is covered through your employer. Then if you're on the private side, then you are um, you are going to be asked to pay a lesser amount. By the way, this already happens for individuals uh, through some of the public arenas. For example, if you're through Calpers, I believe. Uh, you're already paying only fifty dollars of uh, copay. You're not paying more than that. So this program has worked, and we're just expanding it to everybody else. Yeah, you you shouldn't have to choose of whether to use your insulin or not if, if uh, you know money is tight. So yeah, that's a that's a great bill. Um, I guess just kind of to move on, I guess a little bit to to the business and the economy. The governor today made a couple announcements regarding uh, some stage three openings. Um, I know the in- entertainment industry has been shut down. Uh, people have been, I guess, out of work or on the sidelines. Uh, it looks like they may be able, I guess, to start up again pretty soon. Um, you know, I guess, have you been talking with your your local businesses and your local, I guess, entertainment folks and keeping tabs on what they're doing and kind of assessing how they're going to start up again? Thank you for that question. In fact, it's funny. We, we, we've just been in communication quite a bit this week because we were, we were trying to see how we can get especially some of the studios or, or, or some of the sound studios and sound stages and some of the uh, even more recording industry back to work quicker because there's already quite a bit of physical distancing required or part of the work that goes into uh, uh, these studios. So we were trying, especially the recording studios. So we were trying to get a little bit more clarification for them. And we've been working with GoBiz. Uh, we're still in conversations with them today. Um, and, uh, and, and Universal Studios is uh, the biggest employer in my district biggest private sector employer in my district. So, so we've been in constant communication with them uh, in order to make sure that they're getting the support that they need. And the administration has actually been very mindful of that. They, they're, they're aware of how critically important it is. And, and this is an industry that you can't just overnight turn on and have all segments firing at once. Right. Uh, so it's going to need some startup. You're going to need to be able to recruit uh, short-term talent again. And so there are several steps that go into place 
before firing up the entire industry quickly. So um, while the writers have still been actively engaged, uh, you know, some of the other components within, within the industry have stopped entirely. And so starting it up again is going to require a little bit of lead time. And that's why we've been working with the administration closely to make sure that we can get afford that lead time so that the industry starts out and, and doesn't lose much time. And I guess, you know, I, you know, I get asked every day, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Is there a date? You know, I guess, have you give, got any, I guess, clear guidance from them on, you know, a date certain? Are we looking at weeks? Are we looking at a month? Is it just a matter of days? It's such a difficult question to answer when, when you're, when, so when you're looking at the graph, you're seeing a certain consistency being established, but then that's a statewide number. And then when you look at LA County numbers specifically, and you're seeing that in the last few days, we've had some of the highest spikes that we've ever had in deaths and the number of uh, contractions. Now, the number of contractions is just purely based on testing. And as testing has expanded, that number is going to expand anyway. So that doesn't really say a lot. But, but when you see the number of deaths still accumulating on a daily basis and the impacts on families, uh, it's, it's really a struggle. And, and, and I'm hearing from constituents on both sides. I have constituents calling me in really uncomfortable that we're really starting up the economy quickly. But then when you look at the communities and the area regions that have been disenfranchised by these closures, by, by by the closure of segments of the economy, wholesale uh, uh, segments of the economy. It's also, uh, you understand how there, that could lead to further frustration and anguish and, uh, and, and other consequences of loss of property and, and uh, 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 also leading to loss of life in certain cases. I and mean, isolation has been a very serious issue amongst our seniors. Uh, and, uh, and I think if, if this endures for a longer period of time, we're going to be seeing the impacts of isolation and or financial restraints on many other folks uh, of all different age groups. So, so it's, it's, I'm not telling you anything you or your listeners don't already know. It's, right. uh, it's, it's, it's this balancing that in many ways, I feel also it's a little too soon to be moving forward with opening up, but, uh, I think. What's critical is that there's been a level of awareness established also that even as we're taking steps to move forward, we need to make sure that we're vigilant, uh, whether it's with the washing of hands or being much more careful in our interactions on a daily basis so that we're not allowing for there to be a very strong second surge of, uh, of deaths and infections. Yeah, you know, like earlier you brought up, you know, the demonstrations and the protests this this week. Um, you know, I heard a lot of county health officials were nervous because you have all these people gathering together, including, you know, not social distancing. Uh, you know, some are wearing masks or some aren't. So it, it should be interesting, I guess, to see in the next 10 to 14 days to see, I guess, how these numbers uh, look. So, yeah, yeah. It's going to be interesting times. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us today. I guess, is there anything else you want to cover before we go? <laughs> I, 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 think we, I think we covered quite a bit. I, I would just ask uh, your, your listeners to pay attention to, uh, uh, to uh, the hearing that we're going to be having, the joint hearing that we're going to be having on Tuesday. I think that's going to be important moving forward of how we address uh, some of the long-term related issues on uh, uh, skilled nursing facilities. The other thing that I just wanted to mention that I, I forgot, as you, you asked, that I, I, I left out, but um, on long-term care, we had started working with the insurance commissioner also on dealing with, um, uh, you know, long-term long-term care insurance premiums, and uh, we were going to continue doing some bills this year and potentially also look at a long-term fix. For this, right. you know, do we at some point include a small fraction of uh, within the, the payroll tax system in order to help finance long term care? I mean, that's just one of the options. Um, you know, how do you create a continuous revenue stream so that we can afford paying for long term care? Because, you know, uh, uh, um, some of the other programs in place, especially the federal program in place with uh, Medicaid, with uh, 
uh, uh, um, Social Security did not is not coming to really help. And so moving forward with increased costs, uh, what are what are the steps that are, we're going to need to take in order to be able to address the long term care needs? So those are going to be some discussions that are also going to be critical moving forward. Um, that I hope for us to continue uh, uh, after after some things with COVID nineteen uh, settle. Okay, great. Well, we'll we'll look forward to seeing you on Tuesday to see uh, what comes up, and uh, we'd love to have you back on again. Thank you so much, Adrian. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Right. Bye. Our Oh, ¿Cómo va a empezar?